I'm Cindy Boxer, and you are listening to the Fiber Artist Podcast, where we chat with artists, makers, and creatives who work with fiber, get to know their stories, how they came upon their fiber practice, and more about the person behind the work. Oh, hi there. Are you still listening? All right. So it is now March of 2020, and I'm coming to you with my first episode of the year, but I promise I'm still here. So thank you for continuing to... uh, support and download and listen to the podcast. Um, But first, I just found out about the coolest organization. And um, since many of you are fiber artists and creatives who work with fiber, I thought you would want to know about them too. And I actually asked them to become a sponsor. So today's episode is brought to you by the Livestock Conservancy. Um, Now listen, don't fast forward because I I seriously think you guys will want to know about this. Have you ever worked with wool from Navajo churro sheep, or what about Caracol, Hog Island, Florida cracker, maybe? Okay, that last one kind of sounds like a racial slur, but it is not. It is a type of sheep that is in danger of becoming extinct. The Livestock Conservancy has come out with a program called Shave em to Save em. They work with fiber artists to help us all to learn about wool from sheep that is on the conservation priority list. And uh, they started this program in February of last year with more than 1,600 fiber artists already signed up to take the challenge to work with wool from at least 15 of the sheep breeds that are on the list by the end of 2021. You can go to rarewool.org for more information. And a little bit about the Livestock Conservancy. They are a 501c3 nonprofit. Their goal is to save rare breeds of livestock from extinction. Many of the older breeds have been replaced by modern hybrids, so they're essentially unemployed and are unable to earn their keep. One of the goals of the Livestock Conservancy is to put these animals back to work. And with sheep, that means that people need to start using their wool. When you join the program Shave Them to Save Them, you'll receive a passport where you can keep track of your fiber accomplishments as you knit, crochet, weave, felt, or spin your way through wools like Clune Forest, Cotswold, and Black Welsh Mountain. And when you complete 5, 10, and 15 projects, you earn a prize. Again, you can go to rarewool.org for more information. I mean, listen, guys. Sheep need a job in order for shepherds to raise them. It sounds pretty basic, but I don't think a lot of us really think about it this far back when we think about, um, you know, where we're sourcing our our wool. Um, For decades, many shepherds have raised some of the rare breeds at a financial loss simply because they love the sheep and didn't want to see them become extinct. But, you know, we can't really count on their charity forever. And we really shouldn't have to. Let's support, uh, you know, rare wool. All of the breeds have their own unique awesomeness. The 22 breeds on the list range in micron count from next to skin soft all the way to tapestry and rug wool. Some don't pill or felt, which means you can just throw them in the washer and dryer It's really up to us to give these sheep a job so that the shepherds can continue to raise them and so that they'll be around for the next generation. Am I right? So anyway, you can go to rarewool.org for more information. I've actually gone to the website and it's really cool because you can search by location and find farms that are close to you. And um, I think you can actually just go visit and purchase in person. And so you're not only saving the sheep, but you're shopping local and supporting your local farmers. So I think that's pretty cool. Again, rarewool.org for more information. All right. And without further ado, today's episode is with Rachel Denbo of Smile and Wave. She is such a wonderful fiber artist, and not only that, she's an amazing teacher. She's got a bunch of e-courses online. She'll teach you beginner weaving, round weaving, uh, latch hook and locker hooking, which I didn't even know was a thing until this conversation. Anyway, I had a great time talking with her. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Here's Rachel. You are a busy lady. We've been trying to uh, oh, schedule goodness. this for like since Thanksgiving, I think. It's been insane. I think it was before that. I, <laughs> I probably reached out to you like, I don't know, early November, maybe late October and just, man, our stars were not aligning. They were not, but they are today. They thank are. Goodness. I know. Thank goodness. <laughs> it looks so pretty behind you with your weaving set up. Thank you. I've been trying to rearrange in here. This is kind of my... Um, room where I, it's like a, it's kind of like being in a rental. I can't paint the walls. Oh yeah. So I've got my, these white doors with hangers over the top of them and just trying to do my best to keep the white vibe that 
I like the best. I yeah, mean, like, I like the white vibe too. Um, but the walls in here are like this buttercream yellow, which is somebody's jam, but That's, it's not mine. <laughs> I know what you mean. That's actually our whole living room is sort of that color. Even this, uh, this where what's behind me, I need to repaint the whole thing. Everything looks green. Not to mention yeah. like there's a big picture window across from it where all the green from the woods that we live in comes through. So everything right. just looks green. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Our last house was like that. It was like gorgeous windows huge mature trees surrounding the house yeah. so in the summertime it was just like living in a green lighthouse exactly yeah. <laughs> and then like and then they painted these a like, green shade and I'm like this this whole thing is wrong but the time it yeah. takes to have to like paint everything and I have just dreams of all white walls and I don't know when it's uh -huh. all gonna happen yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I know that that buttercream it's at least you can actually manipulate it pretty easily easily like on Instagram right. right I can do some filters to make it work yeah um, when I need to but um I'm at my parents' house right now, okay. and so they've let me take over the one of their three parking spots in their garage as, like, my packing area. Oh, nice. And so I've been able to paint one of those walls, um, like, a rectangular portion of it white. So I use that as my, you know, taking photos outside or if I need to stage something. Nice. So, but it's too cold to be out there. And Where are you again? <laughs> I know um, central Oklahoma time. City. Oklahoma City. Okay. Is that where you're from? Like, did you grow up there? Um, I was born in Texas, moved to California, like Sacramento area when I was like a year old with my parents. Mm -hmm. And then I went to high school in Central California, graduated, moved to Oklahoma because this is where my parents and my grandparents are all from. Okay. And um, went to college here and got married here, had, then we moved to Seattle and had my youngest, okay. uh, Sebastian, my oldest, sorry, Sebastian. Uh, then we moved back to California during the recession. Oh, boy. Uh, then we moved back to Missouri for a few years, and Ruby was born there. Um, and then we moved – Brett was in the Army, so we had to move to Colorado Springs oh, for a few years. So it's and military up, family. That's why you're moving, doing so much moving? Part of it. Part of it was just we you know, rented a lot, and it was kind of like – uh, we moved to Seattle for Brett to do grad school, and then the recession hit in our apartment. Mm -hmm. We lived in and we worked there and they sold the apartments to turn into condos. And within a month, we had like a four month old and oh no to live. Oh, <laughs> my like, God. Too expensive to live here with the jobs we have. We had the perfect setup. And then, you know, you only have so much control over right. certain things. So. so what was that? That was like 2008-ish, I guess? Yeah. Uh, well, 2007, I think. Okay. Um, but it was kind of like starting, like the properties were all selling and switching over and it was like right before the housing bubble. Ugh, yeah. So we went and stayed with my family in California for a little bit to kind of get ourselves kind of regrouped right. and moved to Missouri because it's so affordable to live here in the Midwest. Right. Um, and then that's when Brett joined the army. So he was ROTC oh, for two I see. years. So this is like and he joined later. Yes. He'd already, we both already had our bachelor's degrees, but he wanted to go in as an officer. And, um, so we were in Missouri for two years and then they sent us to, uh, Fort Carson in Colorado Springs. And then he realized that's not what he wanted as his career. Mm -hmm. And so we were, um, kind of set free after his contract was over and we moved back to Missouri cause it was so far from our families and our friends. And yeah. I know people would love to live in Colorado, but we were just more like, we need babysitters. <laughs> right. Oh my God. I can't even imagine. Like my in-laws are in Brooklyn, which is about an hour and a half from here. Um, and they take the kids like during the summer, they'll take them for like weeks at a time, which is amazing. Really? And even now they'll take them like, if we want like one or two weekends a month. Yeah. Um, my, it my makes own, so much difference. It's a huge it? difference, huge difference. And so like, yeah, we, it's like, you know, and we're a, little, we're a little past that survival mode part, right. you know, like the kids right. are a little bit older now. But um, my only problem is that they come back super rotten because my yeah. in-laws have no have been a rules. For a while. <laughs> <laughs> so when they were really little, I actually didn't mind because it was like they, they weren't learning horrible habits then. But now they're just like, oh, we just spent like 47 hours on an iPad. <laughs> like you guys can't go to Baba Tiendas anymore. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, well, we can stay up till 11. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We didn't take a shower the whole time. Brush right, our teeth. What? Shower. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, there's always that transition back to uh, real life <laughs> at yeah. mom's house, mom's dad's house. Yeah. 
totally. Yeah. Um, well, I'm curious to know how, so during this time, I guess, so 2008, you're doing all this moving. Had you started weaving yet? Or how did your, no. how did Smile and Wave come about? So I got a degree, got my bachelor's in teaching English as a second language. I'd always kind of been creative and doing crafty things as a kid. Mm -hmm. But during junior high and high school, I was so focused on sports and school and maybe a boyfriend or two. So I just kind of, I I didn't give it any attention. And so then go to college and halfway through college, I'm just like, shoot, I wish I would have done, you know, X, Y, Z, something creative. Right. Wow. That hit you pretty early, I would say, actually. Where you were, where you were like, oh, I want to, I want to be creative again. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, I wish I could have taken all these photography classes or gotten in a pottery studio. Like, I didn't yeah. know what my thing was. I just knew it was important to me, and I liked um, exploring and doing creative things. So, I started making um, handbags and leather journals out of cool. just like leather hides, and sold those kind of on the side as I was finishing up my degree. And then so were you se- of, were you sewing them? Oh yeah, I learned to sew when I was like eight. Okay. And then my mom had to make my clothes for me during that weird transition from puberty to like young girl, like young adult preteen. Right. Like nothing fit, and I was like crying all the time. And oh. so my mom's like, "I'll just you know make your dresses for you, whatever or whatever I couldn't find." And so that kind of instilled in me at a young age mm-hmm. how to be resourceful and that like that was a possibility to like make your own clothes. Um, so in high school, like my senior year, I had my mom help me like put together an outfit and picked out the fabric and, you know, went through all that process. And she was always like we were we we did not have a lot of money growing up. And so she was always like making her own Christmas gifts. So she was mm-hmm. like one of those. 70s makers. She showed you DIY from a really early age. Right. So that was just always part of how we did life. Um, I just didn't really get it or value it as much until I was a little bit older. So yeah, it kind of like uh, at that point, like right at the end of college is when I met um, Elsie and Emma and we became friends, the gals at A Beautiful Mess. Um, And they have a DIY blog. And so we started working together on our own personal projects. And that kind of evolved from like art journaling and scrapbooking to we made handmade e-courses that were focused on like things for kids, like little kids. And um, we did a sewing e-course and did two, did two of those. So it was kind of like um, I'd, I'd figured out what Etsy was Mm -hmm. and I tapped into that market of there's a place for people like me to do something that we didn't go to school for, but we can still earn some money. And suddenly I'm getting all these ideas and Sebastian is on the scene at this point. Um, So I was like making all the baby blankets and all the cute little onesies that had like the bird on it, you know, that whole (laughs) Wait, I have, to, I have to stop you for a second. I did not realize the connection between you and A Beautiful Mess. Yes. So like, I've been friends with Elsie since like 2002. Okay. Um, Just like it, like in real life or how did you guys right. – No, okay. Right. Oh, so okay. Um, Brett, who is my almost ex-husband, and we're good friends, uh, he met Elsie first on a trip. Um, with their churches and okay. he introduced her to me when he got home from this trip and I was like he likes this other girl <laughs> it was, I mean we were dating at this point so I was just like oh my gosh and he's like no 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 no. you guys will just be friends you both like all the weird like creative Make stuff, your stuff and yeah. and hate. he's like you need to meet her so we ended up meeting at a Walmart in like the photo section pre-digital <laughs> digital film or digital photo age yeah um and we just hit it off, and we were the only other like creative friends that we each had because she had, you know, been homeschooled, and you know her family's creative. But right. up, up until that point, it was just like there weren't a lot of people in our circles that we that understood each other. Right. So, right. Yeah, we we became friends, and we went to music festivals together and sold things. Um, and we worked on these art journals that we wanted to turn into a book like mm-hmm. ages ago. But it was just nice to have a person who supported and encouraged that sure. part of life. Yeah. And I don't I know for sure if I had not been friends with Elsie, I'd probably be doing a job I do not enjoy. Right. Right. <laughs> at this point. Um 
And actually, at that time, did you have a full-time job you were having to report to? No, I was a work-at-home mom, kind of Mm -hmm. filling in the blanks. Um, I did do some tutoring for Korean students um, and Italian students at this language center. But it was very much like part-time, put together what you can. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. And then, like, when Ruby was born, I was doing DIYs, and I was selling things on Etsy. I was going around and doing the whole scour the flea markets. And it was all home goods. So like old cameras and Pyrex and tchotchkes and all the mid-century stuff. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the way I was able to like scratch the itch and do something fun. Um, Go out and, you know, flea market and spend money, but then I'm making money. Uh, So yeah, my whole career has been like a series of careers doing something creative. And then I don't know, I think in 2013 is when I did the first uh, one of my first weaving since like Girl Scouts. Okay. And it was just kind of like, I, I want to try something new. I was really kind of feeling burnt out and um, did my first one. And it was just like, oh, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I feel this. Of this. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, and yeah. Ha- had you seen, um, like, do, I, I'm really like sort of fascinate, fascinated by this concept of like the birth of an idea or like the birth mm-hmm. of a concept or even visually like where we're seeing things that make that give us ideas um do you remember like seeing weaving come up I don't even because I feel like 2013 you're I mean people were barely on Instagram Mm -hmm. um it was really just starting out like do you remember where you saw that it was possible to get into weaving again or was it part of like the vintage you know like because I know you're probably running into a lot of vintage weavings um well I think I just always had, like, it's probably two prong. I'd always been attracted to textiles Mm -hmm. and we were in Colorado Springs and there was all this, like, um, all these flea markets with like Navajo rugs in them. Mm -hmm. And then that was kind of when like the Killam rugs were starting to become in all the, and I just was just like, I don't, I can't necessarily afford the one I want right now. So what if I made one or what if I made something like that, that just, gave me that boho, not boho. I mean, that well, it was, I mean, it was, that like, was all connected to, yeah, yeah. Right. Like that, that bohemian aesthetic kind of mm-hmm. California vibe that I wanted, um, as a California girl who was living in Colorado and had all these kids at home and needed right. something to do. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it was, I know Marianne Moody was probably starting out right around then. And I don't know if I'd seen mm-hmm. her yet. Um, but it was fairly close to then where I saw some of her work on Pinterest and I was just like, oh, wow. I mean, this is this is not just like a little random thing. Like there is so much that can be done here. Right, right. And then I was writing DIYs for a beautiful mess. So I was just like, do you guys want a weaving DIY? They're like, sure. And I mean, it was it was not my best work at all. But <laughs> wow, it's the first one. <laughs> yeah, like you got to start somewhere. Exactly. And, uh, did like three or four DIYs uh, within weaving, but my second one was a rug. It was like, oh wow, just dive right in, I guess. And it was black and white stripes, kind of like those old, like not the old, but like the classic IKEA striped rug. Yeah, made out of bed sheets. And I feel like I saw it. I must have seen the tutorial. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had I had it for a long time, and then it got um, wax spilled all over it, so mm. ditched it in a move, but. Um, at that point it was just like, oh, okay, understanding how so many things in our homes are made and appreciating like the process and having the control and the design right. all coming together, something just clicked. And I was just like, this is what I want to focus in on. Um, my interest is here. And even if I only do this for fun or just to teach other people how to get started, like I, I kind of need to explore this a little bit. And so it was probably a year and a half later, I got an email and someone had seen from a public interview publishing had seen, um, on a Google search, the Mm -hmm. beautiful mess post and saw how many likes it had gotten or how much, how much it had been seen and repinned. Mm -hmm. That got me the email from interviews saying, do you want to write a book? And I was just like, Oh, I don't think I can. (laughs) So not even that long after and like a year and a half. Wow. Yeah. And it kind of went from there. It really forced me into, okay, I have to really, I have to do my best in this because Mm -hmm. for one, when it gets published, it's out there for the whole world to see. And that's scary. Mm -hmm. But for 
to. I don't want to waste people's time. I don't want to waste my time. And so it really helped me evolve from where I was seeing it as this like fun hobby as, you know, it just gave me a deeper appreciation um, to explore my own point of view and then also to continue pushing past what I was comfortable with. Right. And um, had you taken any classes up to that point or were you, everything was sort of self-taught that you like cobbled together from what you'd remembered how to do in Girl Scouts right. and then like, like some probably very fuzzy YouTube videos of random people. <laughs> well, it was like that pot holder, you know, oh, with yeah, yeah, yeah. learning Girl Scouts. Yeah, with, with the like nylon, um, it's like pantyhose. Fabric. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, I remembered from that, the whole over under concept. Mm-hmm. And so some of it was like trial and error. Some of it just felt kind of innate, but I did, I remember wanting to learn how to do, maybe it was sumac and I got on YouTube and there was an older lady, her name's Pat and she's probably still on there making videos who did, you know, kind of the I think it was like bright orange and bright green was her design. And I was just like, I think I saw that too. I'm pretty sure I did. I That's like, where I cool. learned it. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. Uh, look the way I want, but I wouldn't be able to do it without you. So yes. yeah. That's so yeah. funny. Um, I think, yeah. And I love that it is something that was embraced more recently in the seventies yep. as just kind of a, it's like a generational thing, you know, and it's kind of, come around again and it's I mean it's been around so many times it's been around for generations and generations all over the globe um but I love that it's mainstream and getting a fresh dose of absolutely current yeah no I mean because I I remember my mom weaved but by the time I was born I was born in 79 and she had some health problems after I was born so she didn't do any of it but Mm -hmm. in like uh there were a bunch of framed weavings up that were hers and mm-hmm. in the corner of our living room all we sat this like half finished loom yes. um, piece that she had been working on that ne- she never finished which is like yeah. what my living room now looks like right <laughs> but I knew like I knew what it was because of that I used to I like right. I remember I used to play the I used to play the warp like it was a harp really and like yeah I remember like going around yeah. and like just like playing with the strings or whatever but um yeah it's funny because like you, you recognize these things as like for me, it was like these old like remnants of whatever she was doing. And I never thought that it would be something that I would be like actively into now. And she's even like, what is happening? I don't understand. <laughs> you just quit your job and you're going to what? <laughs> like, <laughs> She's still like yeah. she she comes to my house and sees like macaroni plant hangers hanging everywhere. And she's like, you're me. Why are you yeah. me? Like, this is so <laughs> weird. I think it's really surreal for her. <laughs> Yeah, there's something that is in both of you that's just drawn to fibers. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's crazy. Um, well, yeah, so I'm sorry, keep going. <laughs> I I I don't even know since uh, I know I've talked in other places about how like um, weaving has been really important for me personally over the last mm-hmm. few years, and I feel like you know I don't I don't think that's a coincidence. I feel like it came into my life as a hobby. And then it turned into something that was going to be really important for me. Um, just, you know, suddenly dealing with anxiety and depression in my life for reasons that are not so public right now, Mm -hmm. but things that, you know, were probably underlying and then they were heightened. Mm -hmm. Um, and weaving was a way for me to not like freak out every day and, and channel that energy into something positive and something that um, kept me moving forward instead of just like wanting to crawl inside and be scared of everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was there ever a point um, where when you were transitioning from just creating your own weavings to teaching others and making that a little bit more of, a, you know, another arm of your business, uh, was it difficult? Like, were you, was there ever any fear there with like showing people how to do this thing that you owned and loved so much? I wouldn't say the fear for of teaching was there because I felt very confident having a little bit of that teaching background from college. Right. I knew how to break things down and organize it and present it to somebody at the beginner level. Um, I was more nervous that I was going to put all this time and energy into something and then nobody would show up or oh, nobody would right. want to take the class. So the harder, the more scary part was just like, 
is it worth trying this out right. you know, financially and with time? Should I be doing something else? Um, right. And I had a friend in near Fayetteville, Arkansas, Stacy from Gingerbread, and she and uh, Natalie Freeman, who also has Freckled Nest, um, they were the ones that kind of talked me into just come down here. It's like an hour and a half from Springfield where we were living at the time. Just come down here and it'll be fun and no pressure. And um, so that was kind of one of my first, okay, let's see if I can do this. And it was great. I kind of got all the ins and outs figured out um, and then started planning a few more um, and, you know, some were sold out right away. Some I had the bare minimum. I only had, ever had to cancel maybe two times that were local because I, I just got sick and I mm. couldn't teach. Mm. But, um, every time I would hit publish and a, and a class would load and I would just feel this yeah. like, oh, no one's going to come. Yeah, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, thankfully it was, it was good for me too, because it gave me a chance to travel, you know, after my kids, like you said, my kids weren't at that, like, I need you every four hours stage. Yeah. Um, I was able to leave them at home with their dad and go travel and expand my own sense of what I can do as a woman right. in this field without just minimizing it to this is my craft. This is right. my hobby that I like to do for fun. So it was uh, doing workshops has been really great. I'm now going to be teaching locally more often at this um, new building that's opened, o Oklahoma Contemporary. They've been at the fairgrounds here, but they've had a program since 1989. And um, I've been hired on to teach 10 week sessions. So oh, they have. Awesome. They have, you know, it's a little bit more stable. It's it's here, so I, you know, twice a week I'll go down and teach classes. Um, and I will probably still do some traveling in between sessions, but it's going to be, I mean, airplanes wear you out sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, traveling in general. Even if you have to be on a plane for an hour, it's the whole day is sort whole of given up toward it and, right. you know, time changes and all that kind of stuff. Dry air. <laughs> yeah, Re yeah. Recycled uh, whatever air. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's so, tough. It's tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's kind of where things have have grown into. But yeah, it's it's been a multi pronged thing. Like, right. uh, but was there? Ever, I think control. I'm projecting here. This is my projection <laughs> question. Where I'm like, well, was it hard to give up ownership of like your own ideas and and like risking that other people were going to be making work that looks like yours? Well, I, that's been the case since I started making DIYs for a beautiful mess. Oh, right, right, right. I right. mean, I've had Urban Outfitters directly copy Ugh, something yeah. I've made for them. Um, things that, yes, they get you riled up and you want to just go punch something. Yeah. But Emma a few times has just told me it's not worth it. Just you put out your work and move on. And if, you know, if they're doing so, like I know another gal who had – uh, pictures taken from their blog and used in this other corporation's marketing with her daughter and it, like that kind of stuff. That's different, you know, mm -hmm. but if it's just, you know what, you just move on and if it's work that's been recreated and part of that, I know. Well, it's way more frustrating to have a, cor a full on corporation copying your work and profiting versus like an individual. I'm, I, I, mind a lot less when an indi individual maker kind of does it. It's like, that's fine, whatever. But mm -hmm. when a full, full on company is just like, I'm going to capitalize on this. It's so <laughs> wrong because they could, there's so much they could do in terms of like working with the maker to bring some, right. you know, light to your name or like, right. just even like a tag, like an inspiration tag. Throw me a bone yeah. over here. I know anything. And anthropology does it all the time, like crazy. Oh, yeah. I feel like anthro free people and urban are like the worst. I yeah, and and it, it makes it a little bit more frustrating that they do sometimes work with artists. Yeah, and then other times choose not to. I know and it's take the design. And, it makes so no that, sense. That's challenging yeah. for sure. Um, I I do when I wrote the book, I knew that all the work I put in there needed to match my aesthetic, but I was only going to be putting work in that was not necessarily like this piece is what I am known for mm -hmm. here. Let me show you how to make it so that I can't sell it anymore. Right. So I kind of went into that with the whole idea of let's teach concepts and let's teach some projects that they'll enjoy, but, um, not necessarily give away all the, all the, not secrets, but you know, things you've put your time in and right. Right. Time to, um, what, and so yeah. what's the title of the book? 
the first book? Uh, is- DIY Woven Art. DIY. Okay, yeah. So that one's that one's out there. Um, it's been out since like three 20- years now. Yeah. Twenty. It was published. That's awesome. So, yeah, I I would love to do another one. Like I'm starting to feel that point of like things don't. I don't feel like things are dated necessarily, but I feel like my style has changed right. a lot since then. And and there's that urge to want to do something new and put something else out there. But at the same time, there's just so much other stuff going on that, you know, I'm so thankful that I even had the opportunity to do it one time. Yeah. And, How was the know. process of writing that book? Um, It was pretty quick. Like they said, they, they emailed like in May mm-hmm. and it was, turned in December right before Christmas. Oh, wow. And so they were great. The The editor was great with giving me, you know, this is what we need from you. This is kind of the feedback after the first chapters. And they tell you, okay, tweak this a little bit. And on future projects, maybe more step outs or more um, concise wording or great, you're doing great. Don't change anything. So it was really, I mean, working with an editor makes everything better. Um, right. And did you do your, all your own photography? I did all of the step out shots. So like the, the ones that, you know, you're putting it together and you take a million photos. And then the finished piece, I had a friend who I loved and trusted in Springfield. And so she did the styled photos okay. and we just kind of ran around the town and <clears throat> asked a few friends, can we borrow your brick wall? And brought all our furniture in and plants and set it up and took some photos. So awesome. it was really a fun process. Yeah. I would love to see you do a, a book too. I mean, that I feel like it's time. It's been a couple of years, you know, is yeah. that something you would have to pitch back to your publisher or? Oh yeah. You, I think, yeah. I think that now that I um, kind of know how it works and I know what they are and aren't looking for, mm-hmm. um, I could I could probably try to propose something and then they might say, yeah, that'd be great. Or, no, that field is saturated. What about this? Um, but at the same time, it just it does take up a lot of time and energy. And so it might be something that I turn into e-courses instead and um, see more direct full payment from instead of, you know, books are great. You don't get paid a lot. Right. right. <laughs> but it's really great to have that kind of on the resume and be like, here, I've, I've got this publication. And right. I think it goes, it can go a long way for future employment. So I can't imagine anything more fulfilling than being like, well, I'm published. So <laughs> <laughs> my mom it's gotta feel has good. Like a bunch of books on her shelf. Like, yeah. Uh, the same book, but like five copies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Did I show you my daughter's book? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, tell me about your e-courses because I feel like you have such wonderful courses out there, um, but maybe not everybody has purchased one or is a little hesitant. So um, I know that there are some people when they launch stuff, they make it like for a limited amount of time where you have to sign up over a couple weeks. And then I don't know if like you do the course together. How does What's the structure of your courses? So for mine, I like to keep it where it's on a private site. So when a student purchases it, they get immediate access and they can go back anytime they want. They have login information and everything has, um, it's video based along with some text so that people can really see all the different movements that go into a certain Mm -hmm. step. And, um, I don't do, you know, a cutoff date. I kind of just, I do like two weeks. The first two weeks when it launches, there's a launch price. So it's reduced greatly. And then after that, it'll go up to its regular price. So there's always time to to find it and purchase it. Um, And then I'll do, you know, like a 40% off sale, maybe twice a year, Mm -hmm. one, you know, right before Christmas and one sometime in the summer. And then I'll do smaller sales throughout the year. But, Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to make it accessible to everybody. And I do, I, I mean, I know how business works. You got to kind of create some urgency sometimes, but mm-hmm. I don't want somebody to feel like they missed a chance. Sure. So I do have, um, I think I have seven e-courses now, two are mini e-courses and they're seasonal. So like if you want to make stockings in January, yeah. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Right. But um, the other ones are beginning, um, well, there's a beginning weaving and an intermediate weaving. And I have a natural dyeing with plants e-course. Mm-hmm. And then I have weaving in the round and then my latch hook and locker hook e-course, which I just launched about two weeks ago. So 
Um, yeah, congratulations on that. I know you're working you. on it for such a oh, long my time. <laughs> I kept telling you it was not ready yet and it's not ready yet. <laughs> Um, it, yeah, it, holidays kind of got in the way of, uh, oh my God, they get in the way of everything. Anything done. Yeah. Um, so had you already, had you been working with that technique, the latch hook and lock hook for a while, or is it something you mm-hmm. learned recently and just wanted to share? How did like, I, yeah, well, did so I had, out? I'd made like a latch hook while hanging maybe 2017 for a beautiful mess. Cause mm-hmm. they wanted like, how do we get a woven wall hanging look without learning how to weave? Okay. Well you can do this. Um, so I had done it a few years prior and you kind of learn the process through that. It's, it's pretty simple. Once you learn the techniques, then it's just about how can I design to this to make it what I want it to, to look like. Mm-hmm. Um, so the e-course, uh, goes over latch hook and locker hook, which I had never heard of. I had never heard of it. I honestly I had no idea right? what it was. Like, and then, <laughs> and then you that. launched and I was like, what the what? <laughs> I know. I had to do a little bit of research on that because I was just like, well, I mean, it looks cool. I guess I need to figure this out. Again, very simple. Yeah. And then once you understand the technique, it's just about how do I uh, finish the edges off or how do I know how much mm-hmm. yarn I need to do X, Y, Z. Um so I cover in the e-course five projects. There's a pillow. There's two wall hangings, a little container. I think I have it over here. See if I can grab it. Like I have this little container. Yeah, I love that. That's so cute. Stuff. And then a rug, which I'm sitting on. I use it as like my chair pad. Oh, nice. And it's so secure, huh? It is. Once you get it in there, I mean, unless you have somebody that's yanking them out on purpose. Like is, a four-year-old, you know. Um, <laughs> is that how but, most, um, like, plush rugs are made then? It's funny. I feel um, like it's I should similar. know. I mean, I think punch needling is right. a method that some rugs are made by. Um, and it's a similar concept for, you know, what you can get with a, the end result. But the tools are different. The um, structure the canvas you use is completely different the stitching all of it is different so similar outcome different techniques I don't know if it takes longer than punch needling but it's it's definitely like a excuse me it's a repetitive meditative type of Mm. movement and so once you get it down it's like you can zone out you can listen to a podcast and come up with this really cool piece when you're finished yeah yeah what's your favorite kind of um type of craft at the moment like, I think it's weaving again still weaving, like yeah. I kind of got the latch hook out of my system and I hadn't been weaving for a while because I'd been trying to get the e-course finished and um I'm just ready to get back at it I think I, I keep telling myself like I want to try punch needling again and I did a project again for a beautiful mess that's kind of my way to like test things out sometimes yeah <clears throat> and it was embroidery punch needles, so it was much smaller than um, what a lot of people are doing right now. And and I like it, but it just really has to catch, like grab me. Right. And I think, like with knitting too, like I just I can't. Well, get yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, N- knitting and crocheting, I learned within the last year and a half, both of them, and um, I just like it doesn't allow for any creativity if you don't understand how to make like because I guess it's because it's all functional items you right, know like right. you can't really There's go so much freeform caffeine. on a sweater and have it actually look right good <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. or you even gotta really know the rules to be able to break any rules yeah that. exactly exactly yeah. yeah like I have I have no ability to be creative with knitting and and crochet but I know people have like I've seen people do like sculptural crochet stuff mm-hmm. um but yeah when I try it's just a mess and it's not yeah. beautiful. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the classes that you're going to be teaching locally, are they, is it like a, you sign up for a series of 10 or is it like each one is its own independent, like three hour thing where you, cre- where you finish something? It's a, you know, 10, 10 weeks sign up, pay the full amount, you know, the first week or whatever. And then it's two hour sessions. So okay, two hours, two hours a week. Um, and I think the the three classes I'm teaching intro, intermediate framely weaving, and then intro to natural dyeing, they're all about $200, which, you know, that's a not lot bad. Of, yeah, that's really good. A actually, lot of, Like workshops, like e-course or not e-course, a lot of, um, workshops are about 150. Mm-hmm. So that's like three hours worth of work. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So this this is a for locals. It's a great option because you also get to come in and you get critiques, um, you get feedback from the teacher, and you have that community that gets built in. Um, and then there's other opportunities to do like group shows at the end, and so it's just really fun to kind of see how a local situation is going to look different than like going here for one day one day, and yeah. people again and um, never knowing if they even finished it when they went home, you know, not having that accountability to like keep learning. So right, right. excited about it. I think it'll be really fun. You're going to make friends. <laughs> it's like a like new, a, way, new way to get out there, you know, I know and just like, like actually meet people. Face to face, like. I know. <laughs> That's uh, like this podcast for me is kind of that. Right. And I have I was thinking about it because I haven't actually recorded one since December, um, which was Jen from Nova Mercury. And but yeah. I was like coming up to this, I was like, oh, my God, I'm nervous because I haven't really, really talked to it an adult for an extended period amount of time like it's um, hibernating season yeah, yeah. man it, there's it's funny like you and I'm like do I remember how to talk to people like I don't know what to, I know right like, it's really one I of those how to ask questions anymore yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly it's one of those weird things um so um I want to ask like oh okay so uh when it comes to like inspiration and when you are thinking about how to design, how do you go about it? Do you um, do you plan your pieces at a time, or do you kind of just let them happen? Well, I think it depends on if it's personal work or if it's uh, geared towards instruction. Right. So I think the ones that are instructional, I have I have to kind of have more of a plan and be intentional. Like, which stitches am I going to teach in this project? So I want to maybe build on the last project. Do mm-hmm. I want to? Um, work within the same fibers as the other projects I've been doing. So if it's instructional, I think it's very intentional. If it's personal work, um, which has not happened as much as I wish, you know, in the last I was going to ask you, have you made a lot of personal work? <laughs> like I, ha- I, I have my loom warped I against the wall and it's just waiting for me. <laughs> and it's, and it's already warped. That's like half the, that's, that's the hard, half the battle. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the not fun part. So, exactly. um, I do, my main thing is, um, on Pinterest, I'll have certain boards that are colors that I love paired together. Another board is um, design ideas that I really like and maybe just images. And so then I'll just go and look through all of those and see what um, similarities I'm finding for things that I've pinned yeah. and just take that concept or take that one like, oh, I really like this. I don't even know terrazzo look mm-hmm. how, how can I translate that into a woven piece or um how can I pair these colors that I'm not comfortable with using already and know that trust that they're still going to look good yeah. in this woven piece so I really I mean I know that it's important for people to seek inspiration in other weaving work because that helps them to see what is possible. But Mm -hmm. it's also, I think, important to teach the process of looking for inspiration outside of woven pieces, you know, through other mediums, like a knitted sweater that you think is really beautiful. Like what about that? Could you translate into or an art piece, you know, go to a museum and take some notes or just go outside and take a walk. I mean, People say these things all the time, but like that, they're, it's, they're the ways that it's work. legitimate. Yeah, you know, the yeah. other day actually, I was um, I was reading a book about chameleons to my kid. He like checked it out from his library and um, his school library, and the photos were so beautiful, and the colors of the chameleons mm-hmm. were so pretty. I was like, uh, would it be weird if I <laughs> mm-hmm. if I like posted this on Instagram because like. You know, it's like color inspo, right? right. Um, and it's so funny because uh, when I was talking to Jen this last time, she was like, "Oh, I look at my kids, my kids' illustrated books. Yeah, Th- those inspire me." And I was like, "Oh, I'd never thought about that." And like yes. when I was reading this chameleon book, I was like, "That's it. That's it. It yeah. comes from everywhere. You just have to open it your does. eyes." It does. It you know? comes from everywhere. And yeah. sometimes, sometimes it'll seep into your consciousness, and you're just like, "Huh. I guess that has been in there for a while." Or I. You know, you don't know it's going to come out in your work, but yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, exposing yourself to so many visual things is definitely eventually coming out in your work. Yeah, yeah. And there's this, I feel like there's this 
way that you need to be in a way you have to be consciously looking or like actively looking mm -hmm. so that you can be open open to actually seeing does that right. make sense right yeah you know, we all go about our day and we like half the time i'm I like I, I now live in the woods when I used to live in the city and when I first moved here I was constantly inspired just by like mm -hmm. taking a walk and mm -hmm. now I see it all the time so it doesn't do that for me anymore right, but right. I feel like I just need to like re see it and know? maybe now going into the city yeah. would be the thing that like triggers totally. you, right? <laughs> totally although it mostly just triggers stress <laughs> so oh, <laughs> too really... many noises yeah and the yeah. traffic I just don't want it <laughs> Um, well, so because you're still, so do you still write for a beautiful mess? Are you still? Doing I do. Daily I am. I am a contributor to them okay. still, but it's. Um, I think the more that I've been focusing on my own e courses, I've not had as much time for that. But I do. Um, whenever I propose ideas to them, they're usually like, "Great, go for it." So, yeah, yeah it's awesome. been it's been really fun to get to work there for so long. For sure. Is that where they're based? Are they based in? Um, so Emma still lives in Springfield, Missouri, but okay. um, Elsie and her husband, and then Laura Gummerman, who also is a writer for them, they live in Nashville. So, oh, okay. Um, but Elsie is from Springfield, too. Got it. Mm -hmm. Well, back in 2013 or so, when we were all kind of starting this weaving process, you're right. I think this whole like boho kill em thing was really um, – was really sort of infiltrating all of our visuals, you know, in terms of Instagram and home styling and all this kind of stuff. What do you feel like is, I don't know, the next kind of wave of home trend aesthetics? I, I mean, I, I love the fact that the the Killam rugs and all the different Moroccan styles are still going strong yeah, um, yeah. and plants plants see. are huge right? i mean they're all yeah, yeah. plants are going to be here for a while i can see um i feel like you know mid-century was really popular for a while and mm. now it's maybe a little more blended with something that's a little bit scandinavian a little bit like art deco yeah you know there's, there's a lot of 80s influence right now with colors and curved velour couches yeah. yes which i <laughs> I am slow to change, but I am here for it now. I mean, yeah, like, me too. But me, I mean, like, three years. <laughs> if I had, if I had the money, I feel like I would be right. constantly changing things up. It would be super fun, but you know, <laughs> you got to do like one pillow at a time. <laughs> I know you got to kind of do the the small ticket items. That, yeah, it's definitely the thing. Like you want to you want to grow as an artist, and you want to. But then there's some things that are just classic. Yeah, and they're always going to be something you love. <clears throat> it's just sure. a matter of. If your couch is that item or not. <laughs> yeah. It's funny the thing with the 80s because when I first started seeing a pop up, I was like, really? Like, really? Know, like, we grew up in that time. I, I was know. 81. A so. lot of like pastel pink and um, Southwestern themes. Yeah. But, like, out colors. And... Yeah. I was surprised to see it all. It feels like that's coming back too quickly. But mm -hmm. I guess when you think about it, it's been I mean, 40. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I know. I don't even want to say it. <laughs> Really? It's been two cycles of 20 years. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. I and mean, I I think too with the internet, I mean things trends are just going to keep coming around. Yeah. And I think they last longer actually. Yeah, they're not you quite know? as like here today gone tomorrow maybe. Exactly. I, well, yeah, and I think because there's more, I don't know, maybe it's because there's more accessibility to it and um, like even weaving, I was thinking about like my mom freaks me out all the time. She'll be like, what happens when that trend goes? Because it left, you know, like from seventies <laughs> to eighties, it was gone. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know. I think because, hey, mom. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thanks. Now she's really like, ca ca um, the catastrophe thinking kind of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Worst nice, case scenario. Nice Asian lady. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally worst case scenario. Cool. Um, and yeah, so she'll be like, you know, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? What happens if this goes and da, da, da. But I really think because it's more accessible and because we have so many more outlets to not just sell our creations, but learn how to see and create that mm -hmm. I don't think people had back then. Like you literally could just, you had to like go to a class in person if you were lucky enough for something in your town to be offering something then. Right. And now it's like literally Google it. Google right. it. Find YouTube. an e-course. There's e-course. Uh -huh. There's Instagram. There's YouTube. There's so many ways for it to like really, you know, spread spread mm -hmm. its wings in a way. Yeah. Um, I I think it's. I feel like it's here for a long time. I don't know. I mean, I I hope so. I feel like there's so much territory that has not been touched yet. Even yeah. just. 
I mean, there's a lot of beginners. There's a lot of beginners. And what would happen if all of those beginners like kept going with it? Yeah, you know, yeah. so much to learn. And so, everybody uh, wants to make something. I mean, yeah, there's a, it's, it's hard for me to like have perspective on it because uh, I feel like it, with the position I am in it, like I'm seeing so much macrame. So I'm like, oh my God, saturation, saturation. But then I go out into the real world and like tell someone what I do and they're like, what? Like, right? What is, what is that? You know? Yeah. Or, or yeah. their reference to it is still the 70s. 70s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, no, this is what it looks like now. And they're like, what? Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're it's like, funny. like owl hanging on the wall is all they know. Like yeah. that style. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's true. Like, I think I've felt like your mom in the past. There's been times when I'm just like, oh, but what if, you yeah. know, all oh, of this sure. goes away next year? I feel, I mean, <laughs> honestly, I have the thought like once a yeah. week, you know, it's, it's hard not to uh, worry it's about like it. It's a slow period. Right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like if you have a week of like no, no sales or something, you're like, it's like, oh, uh, that's it. It's done. Yep. Or find <laughs> some other. Gotta go up. start applying for jobs. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh, I'm liquidating. Right. Uh, everything's 30% off. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, totally it's... know that feeling. Like it happens like I think always around my cycle too when my hormones oh my are God. just raging and I'm just like, oh, this is it. <laughs> totally. I know. And yeah. you, you really have to like remind yourself like, you know, like January is a slow month. And right. so – I had to like look back and like, what did last January look like? Or, you know, you have to just, I don't know. I know. It's a, it's a thing. <laughs> it's for sure a thing. But um, I, I love that there is this community here. It's not just about the make, like, it's not just about finishing a woven piece. There's friendships that are keeping yeah. people in the, in the communities that are building. Like, for sure. so it's totally offering second, it's a secondary offering of, um, I've got friends that like the things I like and understand why I have so much yarn, <laughs> even if I don't have a project for it yet, kind of a thing, you know. And totally. I, I'm hopeful that that is enough. I mean, with the knitting community, I feel like they've had that for so long. Mm-hmm. Um, people are always going to need sweaters. People may not always need wall hangings, but just that there's something there that need to be creative and that need to... Um, share that with other people and learn from other people and talk about things that have nothing to do with fiber arts, but mm. you know that people are going to understand because you're like-minded. Yeah, definitely. So that's that's looking good for yeah, us. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, wait, so how, wait, how old are your kids now? Oh, my gosh. Sebastian is 13. Oh. Ruby just turned 10, and Smith will be six in, like, two weeks. Oh, you so. have three. I don't know why I thought you had two. Oh, wow. You really but they're got... all in school, so it's, like, a whole new ball game. And yeah. Sebastian will be in high school next year, which sounds crazy because I'm still watching Paw Patrol with oh, Smith. Right. You know, like, it's kind of – they're spread out a little bit. but um, 13, though, that's so independent. Does yeah. he, like um, – can he watch – the kid, the younger ones, if you want to. Oh, I would not that. let. No. He, <laughs> he is not. I mean, if I had a 13 year old daughter who was like into it, a hundred percent, I would do that. But no, he, he would let the house burn down with them inside. Oh boy. He's just kind of like, oh, Smith, leave me alone. Kind of. So yeah, yeah they, yeah. they don't have, have that really in fashion. They get along great. Uh, but, but my two boys are, it's it's challenging for them to enjoy each other's presence right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> but he he's you know he's learning how to like mow the lawns and he's uh, learning how to sell chocolate to the neighbors. He's kind of got that little entrepreneurial drive or not maybe entrepreneurial but just like how to have a small business drive. Yeah, he's, that's that is. He's got things he wants to buy and he's gonna do anything he can. He's folding laundry now. I'm oh, just good. like. Oh. Here's your five dollars. Yeah. Take care of laundry for the next three days. <laughs> Finding a way to make so, it happen. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Do you think any of your kids are gonna have have they have any of them caught your weaving bug? Uh, Ruby has been interested in it, and she went to one workshop with me in Dallas last year, and she sat through the whole class, and she mm. made. I mean, she had a lot of interrupting of like, mom, can you show me? How? I was like, okay, honey, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but she's actually helping me with another e-course that we're going to be hopefully launching by summertime uh, that's going to be focused on weaving for kids. Oh, so yay, I love kind of, it. 
new venture. And I've asked her, you know, what kind of things should this be about? So it's a little bit of a collaboration with her just to get that perspective of like a young creative that's physically able to do something. Right. And not pushing my uh, aesthetic on her necessarily, but like uh, getting ideas for what that age group might be interested in. So that's awesome. Coming uh, at a date to be determined. Yeah, no, that's awesome. God, I could even see that becoming being in book form too. Um, You know, I don't know. I feel like there's so much as parents, we're always trying to find ways to occupy the kids that do not have something to do with an iPad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's hard. I actually just showed my six year old, he's the younger one. I showed him how to weave. And he, Mm -hmm. like, he thought it was really cool for like 10 minutes. A minute. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And the other one was like, he wanted to try it just because the little one was doing it. But then, yeah, he lost interest really fast. So, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do they They... they ever ask you, like, can I have some rope? I need to build a fort or I need to take a collar for my dog and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they 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 constantly want to. I give them my cheap, like the I give them my acrylic yarn, like all yeah, my yeah. all the practice yarns that I bought when I first learned. I still have, yeah, yeah. Like the two dollar whatever red heart stuff from Michaels. Uh-huh. So I let them play with all that, right? <laughs> but right, none of the good know. stuff. They actually help me. Um, they help me stock. Uh, really? Yeah, they help me stock rope because oh, they want money. Right. <laughs> so. Hey. Learn it at a young age, the value of dollars. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And the other day we were um, sanding looms, so they helped sand because we just needed to get them out of the house. And I was like, yeah. oh, go help your father, you know. Um, <laughs> so they did help with that. But you I, know. I think I saw a picture of that on Instagram. Yeah, I just, it something. was yesterday. Yeah, it was President's was Day. So, <laughs> so yeah. they were home. They were home for so many days. I was just like, oh, my God, please go do something. Right. Yeah. Outside. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's tough, man. It's tough having kids and then wanting to just, you know, especially with projects like this. It's like head down projects where you want like right. hours and hours to work. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. What do you think you would do if, say, you had a week, no kids? Um, well, I've kind of been going through that with them all in school now. And it's almost, I mean, it really depends on how much pressure I feel to get something done if I Mm -hmm. and this is just how my personality is if I have a deadline I'm going to get a lot done and if I know I only have four hours a day to do it it's going to get done um if I have a whole week and it's just like I'm left to my own devices I'm not going to get much done because I'm just going to wall gag the whole time and just be like oh this is what should I do well what would you want what would you want to do that has nothing to do with fiber art Mm, I don't know is there anything else to do like uh, (laughs) I I mean, so ceramics, I, I took a class last year, two or no, it's been like two years. I don't even know. It was so hard, but I loved it. And I was... Um, Did you work with a wheel or was it all hand? Um... I learned how to throw and it was like a six-week class. Oh, cool. But then we moved and then it was just, it's a little bit less accessible, you know, because you need a wheel and right. kiln and all that stuff. So this new place I'm going to be working at, they have eight ceramicists and there's a huge portion of the building that oh, is awesome. dedicated to it. So I'm kind of excited about the opportunity to maybe learn a little bit more, just practice the basics and come out with my own <laughs> full set of like dishware be like, okay, now I, I have plates for me. So yes, totally. I made them all. <clears throat> but yeah, that's just, that's, that'd be something. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. What would you do? Um, I'm really into riding horses. Yeah. So, yeah. That's like something that I, I, I like purposely and very actively make time for each week because it's either that or yoga. Like I have, and like getting older too, if I don't stay active, mm-hmm. I swear to God, my mind starts to go. Like mm-hmm. I get really bitchy and yeah. um, I like, I have no patience. I get really anxious. And it, mm-hmm. you know, people used to say this, like, oh, yeah, you need regular exercise, blah, 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 blah. But in your 20s and even in my 30s, I didn't need it. Like, I right. liked it and I would do it whenever. But now it's like a, it's like a, um, I cannot. It's like it? a prerequisite to a healthy week. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I can't, if I skip like three days in a row, I can do like, I can skip one day, one or two days. If I go to three, mm-hmm. I'm not doing well. And I don't <laughs> sleep well then. Yeah. So that would be my thing. I would have like, mm-hmm. I would do like a week. I think I would do a week of where I could go do one of those like, I just discovered that they have yoga, horseback riding. What? Retreats. 
And I'm wow. like, oh my God, I am that's so fair. in that's for it. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. I mean, yeah. it. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you absolutely. write Western or English? English, English. Oh. Yeah. It's fun. So, is there like staples close to you? There are, because now that I live closer to the country, I mean, I live in the country, but um, yeah, there's a the bar that I write at is like 18 minutes away, and um, yeah, it's awesome. I I wrote as a kid, but I wrote a different discipline. Um, mm-hmm. so when I when we moved out here, I was like. Oh, maybe I'll start taking lessons again. And then, like, as soon as I did, I was like, "Oh my god, this is where all my money's gonna go." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, forget. Did you want? Did you want a horse when you were a kid? I did, but um, yeah. I got to that point. I remember when I was, you know, approaching fifteen or sixteen, and my parents were like, "Well, if you want a car, you know, yeah. you're you're not gonna get a horse." And I mean, horses are really expensive, so it was like. I'm pretty sure they were praying I was going to choose car because, <laughs> you know, it's not like this ongoing payment. You have like horses, right. you have to board and whatever, vet bills. I mean, get out of here. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I chose a car because I was also like a wanting to party 16-year-old. Um, <laughs> you didn't want to pull up on your horse to party. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? When I think about it, they should have wanted me, even though it's expensive, it's they should have wanted the horse thing because they keep girls like responsible. You know, like you yeah. have to shovel shit. You have to work to pay off your barn. Mm-hmm. Like you can actually, you know, work to pay off um, the board and all that kind of stuff. And those girls stay out of trouble, I swear. Yeah, because they're busy. <laughs> they're <right>? busy. <laughs> and they're not interested in boys. They don't want to yeah. do drugs or drink. They just like want to ride and like hang out with their girl, mm-hmm. like their girlfriends, you know? Yeah. So my yeah, parents yeah, yeah. really pushed the wrong thing, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to take a so quick um, personality test? Sure. <laughs> it's three yeah. questions. I'm stealing okay. this. I'm stealing this from Whitney Cummings, who stole it from Freud, apparently. Okay. Um, okay. First question is, uh, what is your favorite animal? And don't say like you can't say like your dog. You have to be like like a like an ideal whatever an idealized animal. Like horses, like horses. that was that was like my jam growing up was. Oh also. yeah, was it really? You didn't even say anything. <laughs> well, I was, I was, yeah. I didn't want to be like me too. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. My daughter asks me that question like every day, and I'm just like, it's horses. Oh it's, my god, I dream about them. I beat up a boy in sixth grade because he was drawing pictures of horses burning just to get under my skin, just to be a mean boy. Mm-hmm. And I'd go and I'd beat him up at recess. Oh, my God. He was not going to so disrespect horses that way. Yeah, no, uh No, get out of here. That's, get like, here. criminal. Anyway, so, yeah, we've got that in common, too. Yeah. Wait, so do you ride or did you ride? No, mm. I did. I took, like, two years of Western lessons okay. at a family friend's house and earned Christmas present money by scooping up that shit. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. So you know how it is. <laughs> Um, so, yeah. Wait, so what are the three in the, uh, Describe a horse in three words Like what it was going to write this down No, like uh, why why you like them mm. They're strong and wild And Gosh, I don't know I don't want to say useful Yeah, you can say useful Yeah, no, useful, totally useful. Yeah um, okay, uh, second question. Uh, what is your favorite article of clothing and three reasons to describe it? My brown oversized sweater because it's warm and comfortable and goes with everything. Nice. <clears throat> um, and last question. Your favorite body of water? Pacific Ocean. Okay, and three words to describe it? Freezing. <laughs> um, calming. Mm-hmm. And beautiful. Okay. Um, so the first one is um, how you see yourself. Mm-hmm. So you said strong, wild, and useful. <laughs> Those all seem Maybe, to make, yeah. make sense. Yeah. Uh, the second one is how other people see you. So warm, comfortable. Goes with everything. Goes with everything. <laughs> I mean, that could be like adaptable, that right, kind of thing. Yeah. Right, right. Um, and based on how much you've moved in your life, I feel like it probably applies. <laughs> um, and the body of water is uh, how you view sex. 
So freezing, <laughs> <laughs> calming, and beautiful. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess. Be yeah, bored with that, yeah. Make that the first one, but. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Fine, right? I'm going to have to play that trick on somebody else. Yeah. My kid. Maybe, maybe not the oh, last not, one. Not the last one. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny because usually the, you know, the first and second, how people view you and how you view yourself, it's like pr- pretty opposite that they're, mm-hmm. they're not quite, yeah, they don't, they line, don't, up. Line, they don't up line up usually. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Huh. It's funny, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Oh my gosh. We're already in an hour. Um, well, that went fast. Yeah, it went really easy fast, to, right? Easy to chat about life. I yeah. know. I know. Well, I just want to say thank you for coming on to the podcast. And I'm so glad we got a chance to get to know each other better. Um, you yeah. too. Finally, well, after like four months of back I know, and forth. It's about, it's about time, right? And uh-huh. I feel like I learned a lot about you that I didn't know through Instagram. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I knew you lived in New Jersey, but only recently. Like, I don't know why I thought you lived in Arizona for some oh, reason. really? God, I wish. We've actually been talking about moving there. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're so sick of this, like, the northeastern weather. The weather. Yeah. It's just too much. Yeah. But, yeah. Maybe someday. I have to haul a lot of rope, though. I know. I know. <laughs> that will actually, because we, we were talking about Texas, too. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, because I'm, because some of my stuff is imported and then they have to like be close to a port and then Mm -hmm. then it's gonna have to drive into the middle of this middle of the country if we're in texas i don't know how that's gonna work but yeah anyway (laughs) we'll see well well i'm glad that your company exists because you thank you have such a great selection of fiber and thanks great colors and good variety of sizes and so yeah i hope i can keep it going it's every day I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot yeah. of there's a lot of other rope sellers now. I'm like, uh, I just gotta keep well, like keep the variety up and right. you know, hopefully my dad always says just be consistent and people are gonna remember you because you've been there forever. So Yeah. yeah. Oh that's true. <laughs> I'll try to remember that when I'm freaking out at three AM. <laughs> uh, yeah. I feel like I mean you've been doing this for a long time, right? Like I feel uh, like Yeah, I'm coming up on five years now. Yeah. So. It's been a while. Well, you know the ropes better than anyone. Like, no pun, no pun no, intended at all. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love puns. That was awesome. <laughs> um, On that note, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, before we go, what is uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give um, somebody who is trying to find their creative voice in weaving right now? I would say keep making and just keep making for yourself. Don't make things to impress people online. Don't make things because you feel like that's the only thing you're seeing right now. And to look outside of the weaving world for inspiration, because I think that's an important way to move in a, in a unique direction. It's hard because it's, it's like, there's a lot that looks similar and there's reasons for it because they're, there's beautiful designs they're beautiful color pairings um but if somebody's and it, i struggle with this too looking for your point of view mm-hmm. you gotta go you gotta go inward and you gotta put the hours in so absolutely very wise rachel <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much again and well um, it was a pleasure yeah. oh um where can we find you where can everybody find you okay so i'm on instagram i'm a uh, smile and wave mm-hmm. and it's a and D and wave. Um, and then I do have a link to my website there where people can find e-courses. Um, I do have a separate website, but it's kind of like the stepchild of the family. Like it's, it's been neglected and maybe in the next year I will. Wait, which one's a separate one? Well, I saw smile and wave. Rachel Oh, okay. We'll redirect to my website, but it's, there's nothing unique. There's not a unique reason to go there right now. Gotcha. Kind of a work in progress. So Right. So uh, smile smile and wave dot big cartel dot com, com is yeah. the website. Okay. There's the link on there. So and, yeah. And what are the e courses you have up right now? Um, I have woven first steps, which is the beginners uh, weaving. Woven next steps is intermediate weaving. Mm-hmm. Woven in the round. And then I have uh, hooking latch and locker. I, I love that title of <laughs> that. I Googled it. I was like, oh, I don't want to get myself in trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> Hooking? No, I loved it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Forged Color is my natural oh, dye. 
course. Botanical. So those yeah. are the five, the five big ones. Awesome. Yay. Well, thank you again. And um, I hope we can get some more people you're headed your way. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate getting to be on here and I'll, I'll um, be, as soon as you give the go ahead, I'll be Instagramming it away awesome. whenever it's time. So. Hey, actually, oh yeah, before we get off, I'm going to take a quick picture of you on my phone so I can post it. Smile. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Rachel. All right. Talk thank to you, soon. you. Bye. Bye. Check the show notes of each episode to get the website and Instagram for each of the fiber artists I speak with. Be sure to give them a follow. And you can view video from this podcast on naromastudio.com slash the fiber artist podcast. If you enjoy the Fiber Artist Podcast, go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you for listening.